little talk today based on a, a chapter I've written for a volume that'll probably be published eventually, but uh, these, these academic things tend to take a long time, and for a conference that occurred a year or two ago, because I think the topic, although the, the full thing is a little bit more specific than this talk will be because it was intended for a conference on ancient strategy, this is about the Great Punic Wars between the Romans and the Carthaginians, and specifically the Second Punic War. That's the famous one with Hannibal, obviously, as um, I suspect most people watching this will probably know already. It's the war when Hannibal marched from Spain, crossed the Alps, went into Italy, inflicted these appalling defeats on the Romans and their allies, broke away some of those allies, marauded around Italy for over a decade, was never defeated in a decisive pitch battle in Italy in that time, but eventually forced to evacuate and eventually the Carthaginians lose the war. 50 years or so later, slightly more, the Romans will go back and they will in three years eradicate Carthage as a political state. So it's a fairly dramatic conflict and it's famous and it's important, but it's also by ancient standards relatively well documented. We have some quite good sources. So the theme I was asked to talk about was the strategy of the Second Punic War from 218 to 201 BC. So that's what I thought I'd give a, a little bit of a summary of today, although you again will know me by now, my summaries tend to be rather long-winded and take far longer than I intended. And this is, is it will be fairly detailed, so you know, um, get your packed lunch out and settle down for a good long wait because this will take a while because we have to build up and explain a lot of the context of all of this. So let's start with the, the wars themselves. We have the three Punic Wars. First one begins in 264 BC, then the second one in 218, and the third in 149 BC. Repeated wars against the same opponent are not uncommon at all in the ancient world. No. Ancient states have this habit of going to war with their neighbours, with their rivals, not necessarily frequently, but routinely. It, it happens. It's one of those things where there will be bouts of hostility. I mean, again, we tend to lump together as the Peloponnesian War, that long rate conflict, but scholars, when they study it, will break it up, as Thucydides did, into smaller sections. But Thucydides also understood it as part of the same rivalry. But smaller states will fight each other again and again. And you, you get the impression from the Greco-Roman sources inevitably that this is happening throughout the ancient world, that one tribe will fight its neighbor for control of valuable resources or simply for prestige, for dominance, for the sense that if we don't appear strong, then we will appear vulnerable and we will be attacked. So repeated conflict is not that unusual. However, the sheer scale of the Punic Wars was striking. In the First Punic War, even a fairly modest et estimate would put the death toll on both sides at over 100,000. It may well have been significantly larger. The sources are less good for the First War than the Second Punic War. In the Second Punic War, in just the years between 218 and 216 BC, the Romans and their allies on their own suffered over 100,000 fatalities. Not casualties, again, fatalities. These are soldiers killed in battle, and we don't know about the civilian losses where villages, farms, and fields were devastated. I mean, often people could escape, but not always. We don't know about the food shortages that encourage disease, even famine in various areas, even if only locally at certain points. So the, the human cost of these conflicts is very hard to estimate. And the Second Punic War spread. It had major campaigns fought in Spain, it had major camp operations in Macedonia, a lot of fighting in Sicily, a lot eventually in North Africa as well. So wide co communities of a very wide area suffered, were caught up in this. That 100,000 dead in just the first three years is simply on the Roman side. The Carthaginians suffered losses as well. And there were more battles after that, if not quite with the, the intensity in terms of the, the rapidity with which those occurred. That So these are unusual wars in that respect, and they led eventually to the destruction of one of the great empires of the ancient world, one of the great cultures of the ancient world to a large extent. Now, no real Carthaginian literature survives, and yet we know this was a highly literate, um, very well-established society. When they went to war in 264, neither side surely expected this. Now, this was, it was something when we'll look at it in slightly more detail in a few minutes, but 
this is done fairly casually. They don't really think this is going to be a life or death struggle. And if anything, you would look at Carthage and think, well, they've got a good prospect of winning. Carthage in 264 was very much the, the senior, um, the better established, the older, the more sophisticated, the apparently wealthier empire. It was an empire. In 264 BC, the Romans were simply an Italian power. They had come to dominate all Italy south of the River Po, but beyond that, they hadn't really ventured overseas. This would be the first time, and then it was only over the narrow straits of Messina to Sicily initially. Again, come back to that in a minute. But Carthage established 9th, 8th century BC. You've got the traditional date. The archaeology isn't quite clear enough to say this is right, but it's part of this great um, expansion of Phoenician activity that occurs in the early part of the first, oh, sorry, the last millennium uh, BC, when these cities of Tyre, Sidon, modern day Lebanon, really, this area, um, emerge and develop. And it's partly because there's been an element of a vacuum of the great powers have declined since that sort of, again, traditionally dated to about 1200 BC, where the Hittites collapse, you know, Egypt fractures, uh, shrinks into itself, uh, the Assyrians are weak at the time, Mycenaean civilization goes, all of this sort of thing. That period of chaos that we don't really understand, but we can see so much change occurring at that time. The Phoenicians emerge as part of the recovery, and it may in part be that these cities on the coast flourish because there's a bit of room, there's a bit of space in the trade, um, for without the dom without being dominated too much by the bigger empires, that they will end up paying tribute to the Assyrians before too long. But they get a chance to establish themselves, and they are the great sailors, the great traders, the great colonizers to a great extent around the Mediterranean world. Um, and will sail as far as to get tin from Cornwall in southwest Britain, all this sort of thing. So they are. They're very important. They're the people who create the alphabet that the Greeks will copy and modify because they'll add vowels and all this sort of thing. So, you know, the Phoenicians are quite big players, even though we tend to forget about them. We tend not to pay sufficient attention to them. Again, this is Phoenician is a name imposed on them by outsiders. And, you know, the Romans uh, call them Poini, and hence from that we get Punic, hence Punic Wars. But again, that's not what they call themselves. The colonists of Carthage claim that they're sent and they're established by Tyre, the um, city that will, in the 4th century, be captured after that eight-month siege by Alexander the Great. So they have links even at that stage, and even in Hannibal's day, there are still some religious links to Tyre itself. But Carthage becomes an independent city that founds an empire of its own. So it starts putting out its own colonies along the North African coast, in Sicily, in Spain. Um, it will develop, it's primarily a trading power. There is, but it's, the trade is based around cultivation of particularly tree crops, but others in North Africa. We have to remember that North Africa was far more fertile in this period than it would later become because they're there been less deforestation at this time. There was careful management of water uses, irrigation systems that allowed the Carthaginians to produce a great surplus um, that you know, was the basis for their trading. There was something they already had to sell before it was they started to trade in other goods and make a lot from that. So Carthage is the great power. Carthage was also the maritime power. Carthage had a permanent large navy. I mean, it might be like a lot of ancient navies that you increase its size dramatically whenever you think you're going to have to fight a war. But nevertheless, there is a substantial part of it that is pretty much permanently embodied. Presumably the rowers are, and other crewmen are, are paid professionals that are trained to do this. So they're, they're, they're pretty good at this sort of thing. So the Carthaginians are a well-established, powerful nation, and they don't really face big threats. They have difficulties in Sicily. There's always friction there and they're never able to dominate Sicily because you have powerful Greek cities, Syracuse among them, that they never quite are able to overcome. You have kingdoms to the west in Africa that can be hostile, but they're not big enough and united enough to overthrow you. And, you know, when you establish presences in Spain and elsewhere. Yes, there are local opponents, but they are not big and powerful and likely to destroy you. 
Now, in the sources about Alexander the Great's future plans before his death, one story is that he was planning a big expedition to go and conquer Carthage. Maybe, but he died, it didn't happen. They haven't really faced a big opponent until this confrontation with Rome in 264. And there again, you have, following that, over a century of conflict. Admittedly, the two big wars come quite relatively close together uh, within a generation of each other. But that's a shock. This isn't something the Carthaginians have experienced at all, really. You could look back to the 5th century and some of the big wars against tyrants of Syracuse, um, where you could say it's similar. But even then, you know, you, you have to wonder. This is, this is something different. This is something unprecedented. And it will end with the physical destruction of the city of Carthage in 146 and its end as a political entity. Carthaginian city, citizens are enslaved, dead or um, transplanted elsewhere. There will later be a Roman city of Carthage that its initial foundation is surprisingly quick. Um, nevertheless, that's very different. And while there are some cultural traditions, there are some religious aspects that go on. You know, there's, there is a little bit that's taken on and preserved. On the whole, Carthaginian civilization is extinguished and we never really get to see the, the story from their point of view, from their side. So big things have happened and this is a major turning point in world history. And of course it comes, as any of you who are following the, the talks we're doing, the Conquer and the Proud series, it comes at the same time in 146, the Romans also um, sacked Corinth. They've already defeated the Seleucids, destroyed the Macedonian kingdom, the Ptolemies are their loyal allies. So Rome is suddenly the dominant power in the Mediterranean world. And until there is the rise of the, the Parthians in the first century BC, or at least in terms of their, their contact with the Romans, the Romans will not face another organized, literate, civilized, politically united power um, until that happens. You know, so there is a big gap where the Romans are very much the, the largest, most powerful state around. Um, not that all their opponents they face are easy to overcome, far from it in that meantime, but they are, they are not powers and groups that really seem to threaten Rome itself. Possible exception, Cimbri and Teutones in the late second century BC. Again, something we're going to talk about in the Conquered and the Proud in, I think, possibly the next talk even. I can't quite remember what the schedule is. Uh, but nevertheless, on the whole, this establishes Rome as bigger by degree and more powerful than any other rival. You know, it is simply the big empire from this time on. And even when it does confront the Parthians, the Roman Empire is significantly larger. It's just that the Parthians are much bigger than anyone else who's out there. So this is a major turning point which makes the Punic Wars interesting apart from the, the drama of the story. So it is an important part in Rome's rise as well. It's always tempting to see that rise as inevitable, to just assume, because we know the Romans are going to conquer so much of Europe, North Africa, the Near East, and last for so very, very long, and leave such a big impression on subsequent history, that we just think, well, that's natural. But there's no good sense of the Romans planning on any of this, you know, or of other people suspecting that this would happen. Up until 264 BC, the relationship between Rome and, and Carthage had actually been very good. You know, Polybius talks about these earlier treaties and in the earliest of all that he claims it's very clear that Carthage is the dominant power, but they have been trading. There seems to be, and it becomes abundantly clear both before the First Punic War, in between the First and Second, um, there is a substantial Carthaginian trading community established in Rome itself because Rome is a good market. And there are some things that it can provide from its resources as well, or from its connections in Italy, that the Carthaginians want. So there isn't an inevitability of conflict. These haven't been at loggerheads in the past, nor is there any great, great ideological difference between them. You know, these, this is not wars fought about religion or any cause or any dream of what the world should be, other than that in each case, each power would like to see itself as comfortably on top. The, the Second Punic War to a great extent follows the first because the Romans treat the Carthaginians in a way the Carthaginians feel is unfair and disrespectful after their loss of the First Punic War. 
and there may be you know there are differences in attitude to how the romans and the carthaginians view warfare its consequences and the relationship between the winners and the losers subsequently but that's still not the same as saying that there's an inevitable inevitable drive towards conflict between the two um, because there certainly doesn't seem to be now these are not modern states and they don't have the the sort of permanent diplomatic chatter um, connection that you'd expect in the modern world nor do they really have the, the modern assumption that other states have the right to exist um, that doesn't mean they're automatically hostile it just means they they're more openly selfish about their desires for the world but it's basically about power and prestige something again that Hannibal would emphasize supposedly and of course this is the you know the thing that Polybius would um, say was his reason for writing his universal history that he will write to explain how we got how the world got to 146 how we in Greece suddenly find ourselves dominated by these Romans and it's that sense of it's how the Romans came to this position again it doesn't ask why why is natural well you know if you can wouldn't you that's the assumption they have now when we look at our ancient sources, as I say, they're not bad in terms of narrative detail, particularly for the, the Second Punic War. Primarily, first and foremost, we've got uh, Polybius. Unfortunately, his narrative is not complete, though it is good for most of the early campaigns, which is particularly useful. And then we have supplemented by Livy and various others, most of whom are writing considerably later. Now, Polybius claims to have talked to people who'd been there, though there, there may have been a few old men around by that time, and certainly had access to family tradition and the Roman sources. There were sources written from the Carthaginian perspective. There were two historians who accompanied Hannibal on his campaigns, whose works are known to have existed but do not survive. Both were Greek and who wrote in Greek, which is, is interesting. Um, but it also means that there probably there were Carthaginian accounts as well that aren't even mentioned in our ancient sources. There was some evidence as to what Hannibal was thinking, though again, like nearly all of this, these were histories written with hindsight after the war had been lost. Um, at least that seems to be the case. So these sources are quite good. They do not, however, talk in great detail about strategy as we would understand it in the modern world. So, you know, what are the Romans thinking? How is the Senate planning on winning this war? What's the, the same from the Carthaginian perspective? There are lots of questions we can't really answer. So what the approach has to be to look at what happened and try and understand what's the logic behind it. What are they trying to do? In particular, how does this deployment, how does this commitment of resources, sending an army, a commander to this area, what's the likely intention of that? So that's really what we're going to try and do. And there will be quite a lot of cases, as there always are in the ancient world, where we're guessing. So we've got decent evidence for the Second Punic War, and that's what we're going to use most of the time. Um, but I suppose you've always got to be honest and say, a lot of this will be best guess with available evidence and inevitably although I try not to impose you know my own thoughts on everybody all the time in a paper like this inevitably this is my best guess with the available evidence so there are other ways of interpreting some some of this um, there's a lot of stuff that is as well established as it's ever likely to be therefore we can deduce that that's you know that's going on that's reasonable um, so we're going to have to look and think about um, what they're trying to do but one big problem is that the sources we have are not you know a dispatch written by a commander during the course of a campaign uh, perhaps polybius and others drew upon material of that sort again let's not get too um too finicky about what we're actually defining in that way but there were certainly letters and correspondence going between commanders on both sides and their home governments though again we don't know how much we also don't really know in most situations what they actually knew. What information did they have to go on to make the decisions and form the plans that would shape each successive campaign? And how far did new information alter what they were planning? Um, you know, how well did the Romans know just how strong Hannibal's army was uh, at various times and where it was? Again, there are some stories that make it clear that 
they were guessing a lot of that and the same way and each side is obviously trying to deceive the other so you can't always do more well in fact all you can do is guess as to this is the sort of information they have this seems to be the logic of what they think is going on and what they're trying to do but before we get into that i guess a, a brief narrative of the, the wars is probably worthwhile for the benefit of those who either haven't read too much about them before or haven't for a while just to explain that and hopefully to make this useful and interesting to someone who's as interested in strategy as they are in necessarily the ancient world, the ancient warfare, um, and someone who might be more interested in other aspects of the ancient world, the Roman world, whatever it might be. So the first Punic War begins in 264 BC. Its spark is an appeal for aid from a group of mercenaries gone rogue in Sicily. These are Italians who have taken over a city that had hired them and then come up against a more powerful neighboring city. And they appeal both to the Romans and the Carthaginians for help. The Carthaginians say no, the Romans say yes. Ironically enough, because it's not too many years before when they've actually punished a similar group for going rogue in Italy and they've had these people flogged to death, um, crucified in some cases for the, the this, well, citizens were beheaded, flogged to death, non-citizens crucified. So, you know, the Romans have their, they are bending their rules and it does seem to be a sense of opportunism. You have, and this is something where, look at the, the talks in the Conquered and the Proud about the Roman political system and Roman imperialism. You have the two consuls who are eager for glory, and one of them in particular thinks, well, if I go and take a Roman army to Sicily, I'll be the first Roman to have led an army overseas, first person to go to Sicily with an army, and I can win glory by defeating an enemy that's new um, and you know unheard of before. So that's all great brownie points as far as a Roman aristocrat's concerned, the Roman consul. Um, there may also be the element of thinking, well, you know, this, this, it's never any harm having an allied city favourable to us. Sicily is obviously not that far away. And Messana, you know, Messina, it, it is on the other side of the strait. It's very, very close. So it's opportunism. It's, it doesn't seem to be that thought out. They certainly don't seem to do it expecting this to lead to conflict with Carthage. The Carthaginians see it differently. They see it as an interference in one of their zones of influence, that the Romans are basically poaching on their territory. And it's no business of the Romans to support the, the Mamertines, this, this group of mercenaries. Um, and if we don't want to, that's fine. But it's, it, you know, some load of foreigners from Italy coming in and joining in, that's, that's not on. So this is what provokes the Carthaginian response. So the First Punic War does rather happen accidentally. On the other hand, the attitude, particularly the Romans, is rather bullish, it's rather casual, it's, um, oh, well, let's try this, this sounds exciting, let's see what we can gain from this. So there is a lack of responsibility there, which maybe reflects the nature of decision-making, the nature of knowledge uh, within the Roman Senate at that time. And, well, very probably the personalities of those involved. So it's um, quite bold, though, given that it does require crossing the sea, even if you know, only the Straits of Messina, and the Romans don't really have a significant navy. They've got about 10 small warships. They don't have any quinqueremes. These are the uh, fives, the name effectively means, almost certainly not five banks of oars, and the most likely um, interpretation that's drawn heavily on the reconstruction of the, the Trireme Olympius, the trials it came on, but also just studying the sources, is that most ancient warships had three banks of oars, like a trireme. With a quinquereme, you had two rowers on the top oar, two on the middle oar, and probably one on the lowest bank of oars. So it isn't five blokes on one oar, it isn't five tiers of oars, um, but it's a team of five are the men who are controlling one set of three oars. Now, in um, so the Romans build a fleet. That's the, the striking thing. Um, in 261, they supposedly take a Carthaginian quinquereme that's run aground on the Roman shore, or the Italian shore, rather, of the Straits, take it to pieces, copy it, and build a hundred of them. Now, the excavation of some wrecks off the coast of Sicily from a later stage in the, the First Punic War of smaller ships than a, a quinquereme, but nevertheless Carthaginian warships, add a lot to this story because they seem to have been built from a template, almost like a huge sort of balsa wood kit. 
and there are markings on them in the Punic alphabet showing where to cut, where to join, where this plate, this this section would fit within the the framework of the ship itself. So it actually makes a lot of sense, and it's it's not like somebody you know disassembling a dreadnought before in 1900 ish and just copying it um, without having any naval tradition at all. Th the skills involved with building these ships, the carpentry, the metal working, are ones the Romans are pretty familiar with. So it's, and they have built merchant ships and, you know, others. So they're, it's not entirely, but it is still a huge leap. And it is one of those great um, turnarounds of human history where the Romans create this navy from pretty much nothing. And yeah, the odds are the first ships they build are going to be pretty rough looking, <laughs> ropey, and they might not be the, the best of sailors, the most um, sweet looking or sweet sailing ships in the world, but nevertheless they work. And as they go on, these, the craftsmen making them are getting more and more experienced. And, you know, we read later on of, of them training um, crews of oarsmen on sort of uh, frames that are built on land so that they can practice the rowing again. Crews aren't going to be that great to start off with, but they will learn. Now, the Carthaginians are coming to this war with a long, long tradition of being perhaps the greatest sailors in the ancient world, certainly in the Mediterranean world. They have this permanent navy, but it's a permanent navy that doesn't have to fight other navies, at least very rarely. The Sicilian powers can field some warships, um, some significant forces. You know, there's fighting him in the, the war with, with Pyrrhus when he gets involved in Sicily. But nevertheless, it's quite rare for there to be a big, big na naval battle. There hasn't been one within really a generation. Um, so there's not living experience. And the Romans also, they'll develop this thing called the Corvus, the boarding bridge, that... Um, the surprising thing about the First Punic War is that there are six major naval battles in the First Punic War, and the Romans win five of them. And the one they lose is quite late in the sequence. Um, you know, the first encounters, they win, and they win, win very large. Um, and they actually suffer more losses at sea through bad weather and through Roman commanders ignoring the advice of sailors who actually knew what they were doing and falling foul of the weather. Um, and suffering huge losses in that respect. So that's an odd thing. The Romans lose at Drapana in 249 BC, where the, the consul <laughs> Claudius Bulgare famously, when the sacred chickens won't eat, um, the corn to signify that the omens are good for a battle, has them thrown over the side, you know, auspices be damned, and basically it's supposedly the line, you know, uh, um, if they won't eat, then let them drink attacks the Carthaginian fleet at Drapana anyway and suffers an absolute tonking and gets defeated, um, but survives and, you know, goes back home to uh, be a, a proud Claudian. And subsequently, a few years later, you have the story about his sister complaining about the, the size of the crowds in Rome, wishing her brother would go off and drown a few more poor people so she could move through. Anyway, so that's the, the surprising thing. And these are big, big battles. You know, the first Roman fleet is 100 Within a few years, they're building the, um, fielding fleets of 200 or more. Um, at Ignomus in 256 BC, the Romans allegedly had 330 warships and the Carthaginians 350. Now, um, the majority are supposed to be quinquiremes. Quova quinquirem is about 300. That means you're talking about 290,000 sailors, potentially involved in this this battle making it one of the largest naval battles in history if not the largest you could say Lady Gulf some of the the big Pacific um, battles in the um, later stages of the Second World War would be larger but obviously spread over a far far wider area this is all concentrated in a very small place so it's you know in terms of numbers of people involved this is a lot bigger than Trafalgar or the Nile or anything like that or you know even even Jutland I suppose one of the last battles with big gun warships rather than um, aircraft playing such a key role. Now, um, got a little bit ahead of ourselves. Mostly the fighting is in Sicily and in and around it. But in 256, which leads to this naval battle of Ignomus that again the Romans win, the Roman fleet was escorting a fleet of transport ships to land a Roman army in North Africa. They win the first battle there, defeat the Carthaginians. The Carthaginians are willing to negotiate, but the Romans want too much at this stage. Peace treaty talks break down. The Carthaginians mass together and put together another army, and they defeat the Romans 
and um, you know, famously in Roman tradition, the the consul Regulus, who's in command, is. Um, asked by the Carthaginians to go back to Rome to negotiate peace with, with the Roman Senate, but is a, promises to return um, whatever happens. He goes back to Rome, the Roman Senate rejects the treaty, we'll fight on, Regulus goes back and is executed by the Carthaginians, all this sort of thing. Uh, you know, there's one story of being trampled to death by an elephant, all this sort of thing. And it's, broadly speaking, it's probably true. Um, the, not necessarily the details of how he was killed, but this is, is what happened. Uh, again, the Romans feel that the Carthaginians aren't offering them good enough terms to make peace attractive, so they'll go on fighting. That's really the only big attempt to extend the war beyond the island of Sicily itself. Carthaginians do a few raids on the coastline of Italy, but it, you know, it's a pinpricks, there's a, a nothing significant at all. And again, one of the reminders of to why the Carthaginian fleet does so poorly in the, Second Pu in the First Punic War was you know, against expectations, is that a fleet's job has far more to do with raiding coastlines than it actually does with fighting other fleets in battle, at least in this period, but quite often in the ancient world. You know, big naval encounters ship against ship are relatively rare. Um, there are periods where that's not true, but for much of the third century and certainly afterwards, that, that's very true. So, the, um, the Romans don't try to repeat Regulus' invasion of Africa, which means that the war continues in and around Sicily. The decisive battles will be the ones at sea. There are only four really big land battles in the First Punic War. And again, apart from that defeat in North Africa, the second battle there, the Romans win all of them. On the whole, they don't fight. This is a war very much of sieges and rather slow, prolonged blockades rather than um, heavy assaults. Um, those do occur, but they're more often surprise attacks if you're going to get in or not. Um, neither side is particularly eager to uh, and skilled enough to besiege aggressively in the way that, say, Philip and Alexander's army had in the past, and as the Romans would do later in their history. So you have um, campaigns that tend to be seasonal, spring and summer. There's only these, these limited number of land battles. So most years there isn't a land battle, not a big one. Lots of skirmishes, lots of raiding, plundering each other, trying to take more cities from the allies of the other side, overcome more of those, control more territory. The Romans are more aggressive. They commit more troops, larger armies. So they generally have the numerical advantage in the operations in Sicily and Carthaginians sort of stay on the defensive and almost want to wear the enemy down. That's the impression. And Hannibal's father, Hamilcar Barca, will command in Sicily in the, the latter years of the war, claims never to have been defeated by the Romans, but he doesn't defeat them either. You know, he doesn't really achieve very much other than not losing tactically, as far as at least he's concerned. The Romans gradually overrun more and more of Sicily, both republics are getting very tired and they're short of funds. The costs of this war have been huge, particularly the costs of equipping and then replacing these huge fleets. The Carthaginians, because they're losing them mainly in battle, the Romans, because they, they keep sinking. Um, and then, of course, they have the defeat of Japan as well, which does lose them a lot of, of ships and men. Eventually, the, there's one last naval clash and the Roman fleet is built partly by subscription. Senators as individuals or senators and equestrians as groups club together and pay for the equipping of the construction equipping of a quinquereme. Again, you've had this sort of tradition of, of civic involvement in Athens and elsewhere, but it's, it's a marked sign of the commitment they have to the state, the belief that we are part of the Republic and we need the Republic to win. So, the Romans win the last battle, the Carthaginians are exhausted, they don't want to build another fleet and try again with no real prospect of, of changing the outcome. They negotiate and the Romans impose a peace treaty on them that expels the Carthaginians from Sicily. And um, But beyond that it requires them to pay for 20 years and indemnity to sort of help the Romans recoup their, the costs of this war. It um, requires them to pay to have the release of prisoners that the Romans have taken, whereas the Romans get theirs back free. It marks them out clearly as the losing side, but isn't so terribly different from the sort of treaty that you'll often get in, in ancient wars. 
However, the behavior afterwards of the Romans is, is not good. Um, Carthaginians also have financial worries. They can't scrape together the cash too easily straight away to start paying the Romans. And they decide on one of those, those things that to suit too many governments over the, the, the ages see something that obviously sounds like a good idea or something really clever at the time because the army, most of which consists of professional mercenary soldiers of all nationalities um, that has come back from Sicily, wants its pay, wants the bounties they've been promised to be demobilized and go home. And the Carthaginian government decides, well, we'll delay paying you and maybe we won't pay you at all because we've got to pay this money to the Romans and we're more frightened of the Romans than we are of you. However, their army mutinies, um, rebels, and in spite of the difficulty of working together in different languages, in spite of the fact that the Carthaginians have always provided the higher echelons of command, so you haven't got experienced generals, they rebel. Hamilcar Barker, Hannibal's father, will actually win his biggest battlefield victories up to this point, fighting against his own former soldiers who've rebelled against Carthage. It's a very brutal war. There's cruelty atrocities on both sides. And um, you know, it's a fairly near run thing. And it's also fought around Carthage itself. So it's very dangerous, very disturbing in that respect. But the Carthaginians manage to win it. And <coughs> It takes them three years, and it's a pretty brutal affair. And during the course of this, this war will end in 237, but a year before that, in 238, the Romans take the opportunity of a rebellion against Carthaginian rule in Sardinia to seize the island of Sardinia and basically tell the Carthaginians, well, if you don't like it, we'll declare war on you again. You know, that's <laughs> if we can find another war if you want, but I don't think you're going to do well. So lump it, essentially. That's a major humiliation. The treaty was certainly strict before, but this added on top is treating the Carthaginians as if they are a very small state, not the great empire that they, they have been and they feel themselves to be. So quite understandably, the reaction to this is that once the, the sacred war, as it's called, or the truceless war against the, it, it, their own former soldiers, the, the mercenaries who've rebelled, the Carthaginians from 237 onwards begin a big program of expansion in the Iberian Peninsula, um, led by Hamilcar Barker and then by successive members of his family. You know, this is the man who claims he's never been defeated by the Romans. He's just defeated his, again, his former soldiers. So you have to wonder about this, but nevertheless, a serious threat to the state and goes off and begins to expand. And he takes a lot of areas under direct control rather than simply having alliances with them that are good sources of manpower, but are good sources of mineral resources. And many of the communities within the Iberian Peninsula, particularly in the south, are highly developed, uh, manufacturers of very high quality weapons and extremely good soldiers that are very readily um, susceptible to training and fighting within the Carthaginian system and will later prove to be very good at doing this fighting with the Romans but also against each side as well so you know this is this is quite important um, it's never in quite entirely clear how much freedom Hamilcar has while he's in Spain you know, is he doing this because um, he can um, or is he doing this under very strict and precise orders from home government back in Carthage or is he very much a free agent who's sort of you know carving out a extra territory because he thinks it's the right thing to do and he is clearly trying to set Carthage up again to a position where it is militarily strong so that the Romans ought to take notice now it's not necessarily the same as that he wants to fight the Romans again, although that is a possibility. Um, but it's to show that, you know, you have to treat us with suitable respect because you don't want to upset us because we're, we're pretty nasty when we're angry. So that's part of it. He's killed in 229 BC. Again, he wins some great victories in Spain, but he also does get himself killed there as well, helping to cover the retreat of his army. He's got them into a difficult situation. He stays with the rear guard that allows the rest of the army to escape, including the young Hannibal, uh, but also he gets killed in the process. So, um, you know, he sticks with his men there. Command passes to his son-in-law, um, and then after the son-in-law's murder, it eventually will pass to Hannibal. So it stays within the Barkid family for a long time. And... 
Again, that comes back to this whole question of independence. We're really not entirely sure. Hannibal takes over in 221 when he's only 21. So now that's quite unusual. You feel it's unlikely he'd be an elected commander at this point. It is very much he is there as Hamilcar's son. And, um, you know, the, the this is something, again, I've talked about in The Conquered and the Proud. There is a strong impression that in the Iberian Peninsula, Diplomacy worked better on a personal basis and a familial basis, that leaders and groups were more likely to be loyal to someone and the name they knew rather than to a more sort of amorphous and vague concept like the Republic of Carthage or the Republic of Rome. Um, so you'd see this developing. You see it, first of all, most clearly with the Barkid family. Uh, there is the one um, source that claims Hannibal married an Iberian um, princess, noblewoman, um, quite likely. Uh, his, his own sister had been married to a Numidian leader and as part of the negotiations in the Sacred War. So, the, you know, the Carthaginian aristocracy does this sort of thing. So that's uh, that's nice. And this, this woman, Imilse, may have existed. We just don't know anything really about her. Um, but, you know, it's it's great stuff for the, the fiction writers to expand upon. Um, so you have a Carthage that has prospered again. After the defeat of the First Punic War, it still has its great economic strength. It's still the great trading power. And it's built up its military strength and added to its trading capacity by gaining more resources in Spain. Now, there's also later a story that comes up that Hannibal at the age of eight, when he's, you know wants to go off with his father to um, see what's happening in Spain and follow him there, his father takes him into a temple, makes him swear a solemn oath never to be a friend to a, the Romans, which turns in later versions to be an enemy of Rome and all this sort of thing. Again, whether the story is true or not, who knows? But there is a slight difference, to emphasize what we're going to talk about later, between saying you don't like the Romans to saying that you definitely want to fight them again. This may be a, all about reasserting your strength so that you don't have to fight. You are treated with suitable respect. So the Barkids create a large, wealthy province, substantially increase available military manpower from you know, very good material. This is, it's not just quantity, it's quality as well, of warriors who are willing to serve under leaders from other nations and are very good at fighting and willing to be organized and to some extent to organize themselves. Now, um, the Romans had sent envoys to Hamilcar fairly early on to investigate what was going on and he brusquely told them that basically you know if you want us to pay the indemnity then you've got to let us make money here. Reasonable enough the Romans seem to have accepted that. In 226 the Romans go and compel the son-in-law uh, this chap called Hasdrubal. Um, one of the problems with studying the Carthaginians is they have a fairly limited number of, of, of names, so it can get rather confusing. There's a lot of Hannibals, Hamilcars, Hasdrubals, Magos, and the like out there. Um, mixed indexing and things like that, an absolute nightmare when you're doing a book on the subject. Anyway, 226, Roman embassy goes, and they make a treaty with Hasdrubal as representative of the Car Carthaginians in Spain that recognizes the River Ebro as the boundary. Now, People often tend to look at this as if this is a boundary to the Romans as well as the Carthaginians. However, the Romans aren't in Spain at all, other than its diplomatic presence. They're probably merchants, people like that, but they're not anywhere near Spain geographically and show no sign of wanting to go there in any formal military political context. So, and the Roman assumption is generally that treaties impose limits on other people, not on Rome itself. So the probability is that this is actually a treaty where the Carthaginians agree that they won't go any further east than the River Ebro, which is still a fair way from where their, their main territory is at this point. And then a long, long way from, you know, get to the Pyrenees, to get to Gaul, to get to Italy. Um, so it's about the Romans saying again to the Carthaginians, look, we won the first war, we're big, we're important. Yes, you're, you know, we respect you, but you've still got to show greater respect for us. You know, there is a, a pyramid here and we're, we're at the top, you're not, you're a step down. So again, this can be seen as provocation on both sides, to some extent. The Carthaginians are expanding, the Romans are saying, we don't like you doing that. In 219 BC, Hannibal, who by this time is in charge, attacks the city of Saguntum, Monde Sagunto in Spain. And this is because 
Saguntines are at war with one of the communities that's allied to him and he's sort of protecting his own. Again, think of the talk we did on raids and things like that. This is very much how dominance on the frontiers tends to work in the ancient world. The Saguntines, however, either now or perhaps a little bit earlier anticipating this, have gone to Rome and have managed to get the Romans to ally with them. Um, they send envoys to Hannibal once the siege begins, demanding that he retreat. He refuses and, you know, basically tells him it's not up to me, you know, go, um, that's it. But it takes him eight months to capture the city of Saguntum. It eventually falls. The Romans don't help their ally at all in any practical sense. They do send an envoy of, three, again, one of these typical boards of three the Roman Senate loves, um, go to Carthage and demand that Hannibal stops. Uh, the Carthaginians are offended by the attitude of uh, the Roman envoys, as is often the case, but also whatever their feelings towards Hannibal and the Barkid family, they are clearly not willing to repudiate them. They are not willing to say, send orders to Hannibal to tell him to stop. You know, the Roman um, senior envoy most famously have says, you know, I've got peace or war inside my toga. Which one do you want? Carthaginians yell out war. So again, there is a, a willingness to go to war pretty readily in late 219, early 218. Um, that is there on both sides. You know, the Romans are willing to threaten war over something that has been done to an ally that hasn't been an ally very long and is a long way away from any other allies you have. Nevertheless, it is an ally of Rome. The, the fides, the faith of the Roman people, has been pledged to them. Now, by the time the war begins, it's very late 219 BC, so nothing actually happens um, then. So there's a time of preparation, but nobody tries to negotiate and back out. Um, the Romans are also busy elsewhere. Now, the Romans plan to take the offensive in 218 BC to send an army to confront Hannibal in Spain and another one to cross from Sicily, which the Romans control since, or at least part of it, um, since the First Punic War, sail across from there to North Africa, land and threaten Carthage itself. Do what Regulus had done, hopefully better and more successfully this time. They're wrong-footed by Hannibal, who isn't waiting around to defend Spain, but has set out, marching off from New Carthage, Cartagena, and um, marches through Spain, across the Pyrenees, through southern Gaul, crosses the Rhone, crosses the Alps, arrives in northern Italy in the autumn of 218 BC. And it's a fairly epic march just to get there in the first place. The first Roman troops he encounters in a, a large-scale cavalry action, he defeats. He then defeats um, the main Roman force that's been gathered together at the Battle of Trebia in November 218. Um, BC, or November coming into December uh, 218 BC. Campaigning then stops for the winter, as it nearly always does. In 217, he destroys another Roman consular army at Lake Trasimene. Um, there are other victories as well. In 216, he defeats this far bigger army than the Romans have ever mustered at any time and put in one place at the Battle of Cannae in August 216, where some 50,000 Romans and allied, Roman and allied soldiers are killed in a single day and have another 20,000 or so captured. So it's a devastating defeat. You know, only a minority of this, small minority of this army survives. So three campaigning seasons impose this 100,000 dead on the Romans. It's killed a third of the Senate. But the Romans don't negotiate. This must have surprised everyone. We'll come on to this later on. Um, some of their allies, particularly in southern Italy, start to defect to Hannibal, uh, but not all do. These give Hannibal allies, but they also oblige him to protect them, because again, he's not much of a good ally. He's unable to get much support from the Carthaginians themselves, particularly because until 212 he hasn't acquired a major port, but also, we'll see this, we'll look at this later, the Carthaginians aren't very good at, um, they're not committed to this war and they don't have quite the same resources the Romans possess. The majority of Romans al Rome's allies do not defect. And the defectors become the prime target of Roman revenge attacks because obviously they want to show the price of, of changing sides is a really nasty one you don't want to pay. So the majority of allies are loyal and um, Hannibal's army is still powerful, it's still formidable, it's still successful in the field, but it can't inflict 
losses that are as shocking because again it's one of those deadening things that when you've had these earlier defeats nothing can be ever quite as bad as can I um, and you also you avoid him as much as possible and you defeat the the other armies and the Romans actively prosecute the war elsewhere the army they sent to Spain at the start of the war does get there and does keep fighting there it does well until it's defeated in 211 BC um, when the Scipio brothers who've been in charge of this both get killed within a short time of each other, partly through the defection of many of their local allies. Um, not long after that, the son of Publius Scipio, uh, Cornelius Scipio, the, um, the, the consul in 218 who'd been sent there, although well, he'd actually ended up going back and uh, being wounded in northern Italy, his son is sent out to take command, breaking all the rules of normal Roman uh, reliance on maturity, age, all the experience, all these sorts of things. This is someone who survived Cannae, where he was a, a tribune, a junior officer. Um, so he's been at many of the, the worst defeats. He's grown up, growing to manhood during this appalling struggle with, with Hannibal. And he's learning his trade, he's spending a lot more time with the army than most Roman aristocrats would have done before this, fighting the deadliest opponent the Romans have faced at all in their, their history. Um, so, you know, he becomes, he manages to overrun all of the Carthaginian province and expel the Carthaginians from Spain over the course of several years. Highly successful, proves to be one of the great Roman commands of history. History will eventually earn the name Africanus. Um, after Cannae, Philip V of Macedonia had declared war on the Romans opportunistically. You know, he'd been suspicious of the Roman interests and involvement in Illyria before now, um, but even so, this was a big step. The Romans saw it as a stab in the back. He doesn't really aid Hannibal directly, but the Romans will send naval resources and troops to fight in Macedonia, relying very much on allies. They don't defeat Philip, but they keep him busy and they prevent any real aid going to Hannibal. Whether or not it was the intention is, is hard to say, but nevertheless it doesn't happen. They fight to a stalemate there. They also send troops to Sicily uh, because the Carthaginians have intervened there and there's been a break. Syracuse has decided to ally with Carthage. It doesn't initially, but it does later on. Uh, Hard campaigning in um, Sicily, the siege of Syracuse, your know, involvement of Archimedes, all of that sort of thing. There's even the, the Indiana Jones film recently uh, referencing that and showing a scene of a Roman naval attack on the city being repulsed with the aid of Archimedes and his devices. Um, great stories and stuff there, but again, the Romans win in the end. The Romans capture Syracuse, Archimedes dies in the process, um, and they expel the Carthaginians from Sicily again. And then later in the war, headed by Scipio Africanus, a Roman fleet, an army, will sail from Sicily to land in North Africa, defeat Carthaginian armies there, and the Carthaginian government is so desperate they recall Hannibal from Italy. He's been pushed into a smaller and smaller area in Italy as the years have gone by. His allies have all been taken out by this time pretty much. When his brother uh, brought an army from Spain and tried to reinforce him, he never reaches him. You can see how much better Roman armies are and how much more skillful their commanders are by the way they, they surround and simply destroy um, him at the Battle of Metaurus in 207. The first thing Hannibal, um, first confirmation Hannibal gets of this is when his brother's severed head is thrown into the, the, the outpost of his army. Um, this is a different, it wasn't, this is not the Italy of 218, these are not the Roman armies of 218. The Carthaginians are up against a much tougher opponent by this stage. So, um, they try it again in 205, his younger brother Mago tries to follow what um, Hasdrubal has done. This is again not the brother-in-law, this is the brother Hasdrubal of that occasion. Gets to Northern Italy, doesn't really achieve anything, will die um, during the course of the campaign. Hannibal is recalled, he has to piece together an army from the remnants of his army that had been in Italy, the remnants of his brother, younger brother Mago's army that had gone to northern Italy and locally raised troops. Three distinct forces that don't really gel together. Um, he's defeated at the Battle of Zama in 202. For the first time he's defeated in a major pitch battle and that's it, the war is over. So that um, Carthage is forced to um, 
negotiator pretty much has to accept whatever terms the Romans choose to impose, and as usual, these are pretty harsh. So they are banned from making war outside their own territory without Rome's permission. They have to pay for the return of their own prisoners. There's another indemnity, but this time for 50 years instead of 20. All their territory in Spain is confiscated by the Romans and either given back to Rome's allies now or um, kept the Romans form two provinces in Spain. The Punic fleet was to be reduced to a, a token 10 warships, war elephants confiscated, um, you know, supposedly 500 warships were towed out to sea and um, burned. Um, that may include an awful lot of <laughs> pretty ropey hulks, uh, but nevertheless, the, the first in the Second Punic War, the Romans, uh, the Carthaginians, haven't been able to prosecute it very effectively at sea. So they may have lots of ships in various states, but they haven't got the trained sailors they used to have. But nevertheless, the Romans are determined they won't have them in the future either. Hannibal, however, is elected to civil office and um, does his country a, a great service. At this point, he turns his army into labourers. They start to repair the irrigation system. They get the agricultural system, the farms, the estates back on their feet again, operating again. And Carthage actually manages to pay the first years um, pretty easily. Their economy starts to recover and then thrive and they prosper again, although by this time the Romans have become so suspicious of Hannibal being there, he's been chased out, helped by political rivals who weren't too keen on having him there. And the Carthaginians are model allies to the Romans in the, the years that follow, you know, when they send aid, grain and the like to support the Roman army that will go and fight Philip V of Macedonia. They submit themselves to Roman arbitration in disputes with the Numidian kingdom to the east, even though the Romans are very obviously biased in favour of their ally, King Massinissa of Numidia, who has changed sides during the Second Punic War and was a major element in allowing Scipio to win his victories in North Africa, most particularly the Battle of Zama itself. The Romans do, however, honour their, their pledge to let the Carthaginians run their own affairs, keep their own laws. The Carthaginians even recover so much that they offer to repay the indemnity in one go early on, um, and the Romans refuse that. They want them to remember. They want the Carthaginians to remember they've been beaten. They want to sort of rub it in. So again, you have to think about the um, the elements of um, prestige and pecking order that the, these 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 things symbolize as well as the actual tangible benefits of any money you're receiving and that sort of thing. So there's a lot going on um, with this but it's um, it's very much you know on the whole this peace treaty works and remember 201 BC is when the Second Punic War ends. The Third Punic War breaks out in 149 BC. There's not major friction in between. However, the dates are quite significant. Remember a 50-year indemnity. 50 years where every 12 months the Carthaginians are reminded they're inferior to the Romans, they were beaten by the Romans, and they have to pay the Romans money to ensure that peace continues and they're allowed to run their own affairs. 151, that's finished. Only two years later, and the Romans provoke the Third Punic War. We've have we've talked about a little bit elsewhere. You have the elder Cato, who famously starts ending all his speeches with Delenderes Carthago, Carthage ought to be destroyed. And he has an opponent who keeps saying the, the opposite. You know, and Cato shows these figs that are still ripe and have been uh, harvested on a Carthaginian estate and have arrived still fresh, you know, still in such good condition in Rome to say, look how close these people are. They get their ships back together again. Um, then they could be here, they could invade again. You know, there is still that fear. He was, a, he was someone who'd fought in the Second Punic War. He's part of that generation. So there are members, the terror. You know, we know that Hannibal was going to be beaten. We know that the Romans have this resilience that they didn't quit, they didn't give in. But at the time, it might not have seemed quite so easy. So there was fear, really, in Rome. That's the root of it. The thought that Carthage might recover. And there is something that maybe suggest that the Carthaginians were thinking along the same lines as would be entirely natural for any group of people to do. If you go to Carthage today, you will see the famous, the circular harbour, the two, the military and the civilian harbour. Um, the remains you see were constructed after the Second Punic War. They date to the early second century BC and they have berths for a very large number of warships as well as all the facilities for the civilian vessels. Now, generally speaking, civilian 
vessels with more at a harbour, the warships that you use that are all primarily powered by oarsmen are dragged up onto the shore, onto to ramps, rather than left into the water, partly because the oarsmen are, act as the ballast of the ship primarily, but it's also to do with, with how you maintain them. And then you have to roll them back into the sea or run them back in to get them going again. So those and the, the, the big walls that Carthage repairs, extends, rebuilds, suggest considerable military resources. So, it, you know, the Carthaginians are quite reasonably wanting to be an independent, powerful state that they, they feel they have the right to be. The Romans are suspicious of them. The, the Third Punic War does really happen if the Second Punic War follows the First because Carthage feels they have to set things right. They have to re-establish themselves a little bit like Germany between the First and Second World Wars. Since the treaty wasn't fair, we've been humiliated and we need to be respected again. I mean, it's not as extreme as obviously the, the German point of view, but nevertheless, it's, it's a similar thing. This is more, the Third Punic War is the Roman fears. And bear in mind again, if you're, you've been looking at the, the Conquered and the Proud, middle part of the second century BC, the Romans are suffering lots of defeats. They're not doing so well. They're feeling a bit more vulnerable. Their armies aren't as good. The experience acquired by the generation that had defeated Hannibal has gone. They've all died off. They're all too old. Uh, if any are left alive, they can't serve anymore. And your your overconfidence you win because your Roman is proving to be unwarranted because you're you know you're losing quite a lot of battles, quite a lot of wars. People aren't so keen on serving. All of these sorts of things. So it's a nervous time for the Romans in many respects. They provoke the war with the Carthaginians. They start imposing. You know when there are negotiations, the Romans um, impose unreasonable demands on the Carthaginians that the Carthaginians meet and are still not good enough the Romans then demand even more. The Carthaginians will eventually fight and do quite well, surprisingly well, in the uh, early stages of the war. Again it's a sign that Roman armies aren't what they used to be uh, and aren't what they would become uh, later. So the war is actually harder than the Romans expect but nevertheless it's only fought in North Africa. There aren't big pitch battles. There aren't big naval battles. There's a lot of fighting in ships and boats, but it's mainly in, the, in and around the harbors of Carthage. You know, it's, it's as limited as that. Um, it's to defend the city. It is primarily one long siege. It will eventually be decided by the grandson of the man who'd been the consul killed at, at Cannae, and the adopted grandson of Scipio Africanus, Scipio Emilianus, who will lead the army, who'll be elected to consul at a young age, go off and do what Africanus had done and, and earn the nickname again himself. Carthage is stormed, Carthage is destroyed. It is physically, uh, its walls are torn down, its, its buildings. The only archaeological remains we have from the Carthaginian periods come from where the Romans basically pushed rubble on top of buildings and preserved them that way, but otherwise things were leveled. Um, the, the story you often tell of the ground being sown with salt isn't true. That's a much, much later invention. However, the Romans did formally curse the site. Um, and you know there there is this sense that okay we've dealt with that finally the Carthaginians aren't a threat anymore. Now actually I think I'm going to break one of my rules and rather than normally just plowing on with um, a talk until I finish I might stop at this point because I haven't got a chance to do any more today and might see this might well see daylight posted as a part one um, if not, I'll edit out this bit, and you'll you'll never know. You'll never know the secrets behind the, uh, you know, the closed doors of Studio Goldsworthy. Um, but um, we might just stop at this point before we look in more detail at other aspects. For if we make this a little two or three part series about the Punic Wars and the strategic aspects of the Second Punic War. So anyway, that's it for today. <laughs>